Welcome back, one and all, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown in which we fill you in on all the news relating to rocket launches, spaceflight, and all the best historical anniversaries relating to space and spaceflight that are approaching us over the next seven days. We've got lots to cover here, guys, from the shores of Florida to the harsh, toxic environment of Venus. So strap in and get ready. But before we do that, guys, if you want to make sure that you're getting these videos on time so that the news is as up-to-date and relevant as possible, then do remember to hit that subscribe button down below to make sure you never miss an episode of Space This Week. Anyway, enough intro babble aside, let's get right into this show's first segment, all the launches that happened over the last seven days. Our first launch last week was Blue Origin's New Shepard NS-13 mission, which launched on the 13th of October. This mission was an uncrewed flight designed to demonstrate the vehicle's operational reusability, with this being the seventh consecutive flight for this particular rocket, while also carrying 12 science payloads to space, including a test of NASA's deorbit descent and landing sensors, which will help develop the landing technologies required for the Artemis program. This was also the first payload to be mounted to the exterior of a New Shepard booster rather than inside the capsule, which will no doubt pave the way for a wide range of future high altitude sensing, sampling and exposure payloads. New Shepard is a very small rocket, it's far too tiny to reach orbit, instead it flies straight up, crosses the border of space and then drops back down again, much like how a sounding rocket flies. It then lands in a similar fashion to SpaceX's Falcon 9 booster, with this particular landing being controlled by NASA's experimental landing sensor technology. Our next launch was the Soyuz MS-17 mission, which launched from Site-31 of the Baikonur Cosmodrome on the 14th of October. Its mission was to take three crew members of the Expedition 63 crew to the International Space Station. While it's a cool mission by default because it carried humans, this flight was doubly interesting because it marked the first use of an ultra-fast two-orbit rendezvous flight plan, which saw the spacecraft arrive at the International Space Station a mere three hours after launch. On board the Soyuz were two Russian cosmonauts and one American astronaut. Given that SpaceX have demonstrated their Falcon 9's ability to carry crew from American soil, the first rocket to do so since the retirement of the space shuttle, it now remains unclear if Soyuz MS-17 will be the final Soyuz mission to carry an American astronaut on board, now that NASA has Crew Dragon. Only time will tell. On Sunday the 18th, we saw another Starlink launch. SpaceX successfully launched another 60 satellites into their ever-growing constellation, which will one day bring high-speed internet access the world over. The Falcon 9 used in this launch was previously used to carry the Crew Dragon's first demonstration mission to the International Space Station, as well as the launch of the Radarsat Constellation mission. After first stage separation, the booster touched down successfully on SpaceX's autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, and the satellites deployed about an hour after liftoff. It's now time to virtually visit Boca Chica to check on how Starship SN8 is doing. On October the 9th, Elon Musk confirmed that the SN8 had passed its cryo-proof test, and five days later we saw this photograph of three Raptor engines mounted to the rocket's base. The next tests that SpaceX will need to cross off their list before a flight can take place will be the static fire testing of all three engines, which SpaceX attempted to do last week but has now pushed back to early this week, with road closures in place from October the 18th through to October 20th. Once this is done, we will then be able to see this rocket make a monstrous flight all the way up to 15 kilometers. Certainly one for the history books, and I for one can't wait to see SpaceX pull this one off. As for the monstrous Super Heavy that will carry the Starships into space, the high bay building that will house the Super Heavy's construction has almost been finished, bringing us one giant leap closer to seeing the colossal booster take shape. Anyway, that about wraps up all the coolest stuff that happened last week. Which was your favourite launch? Let me know in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, do remember to give the video a little like if you're enjoying what you're seeing so far. But now it's time to move along to this show's next segment. All the stuff that we've got to look forward to over the next seven days. 
Our first launch this week will be tomorrow, on the 20th of October. This will be the launch of Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket and will be the vehicle's 15th flight. It will launch from Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand and will carry nine SuperDove Earth imaging nanosatellites into orbit. The nature of its payload has earned the launch the nickname In Focus. While Rocket Lab planned to expend the first stage of this flight, as the Electron is an expendable launch system, the company do one day hope to begin recovering the Electron first stage with a mid-air catch from a helicopter, which will be epic if they achieve this, though we are likely a fairly long way from this as of today. Our next launch will be another Starlink mission. Regular viewers of this show will be very familiar with how these launches go. A Falcon 9 launches 60 satellites into orbit and then the first stage lands again. I'm going to leave this launch coverage at that, to be honest, given that we've already described what is effectively the same mission in our launches last week segment with the launch of Starlink 14. And we've still got lots to talk about, like the October 25th launch of the Soyuz Glonass K mission. I know, I know, I did say last week that this would be flying on the 17th of October, but rocket science is difficult and delays are always a possibility, and so this rocket is now scheduled to fly on October 25th. The GLONASS K is the latest satellite design that will form part of the Russian GLONASS radio based satellite navigation system. We were low key hoping that this week we might get to see the Delta IV Heavy finally take flight, but it's looking less and less likely to happen with no officially confirmed launch date from United Launch Alliance. We'll just have to keep our fingers crossed that we won't have to wait too much longer to see this orange leviathan take flight. And speaking of delays, there is also still no official word on when SpaceX will be launching their Falcon 9, Enrol 108 and GPS-3 missions, with both rockets receiving launch delays with no officially confirmed date for a re-attempt. Our final launch that might happen this week is the Chinese Long March 6, which will launch 10 NUSAT Earth imaging satellites for Argentina from the Taiwan Launch Center. Launches from China don't tend to be announced until literally a few days before the launch or after the launch actually takes place. So far, there's been no official confirmation if we'll see this thing fly before the week is up, but there's always a fairly good chance that it might. And that's a wrap on the flights that we can expect, or not expect, to see this week. Let me know down below which one you're most excited to see, or not see, I guess. Anyway, while we ponder the brilliance of that sentence, we can shuffle the show along to our third and final segment, all the coolest spaceflight anniversaries that will be taking place over the coming days. This week's history segment begins on Thursday the 22nd of October, where we will be able to celebrate the landing of the Soviet spacecraft Venera 9 on Venus. The spacecraft was launched on a Proton KD rocket on June the 8th, 1975, and it would go on to become the first spacecraft to orbit Venus, and after entering the deadly atmosphere of the planet, it became the first spacecraft to touch down on the surface and transmit images back to Earth the first time that any spacecraft returned images from the surface of another planet for that matter. In order to shield the lander from the immense atmospheric entry heating, the craft was encased in a spherical shell as it slowed down from nearly 11 kilometers per second down to just 150 meters per second. After the deadliest phase of entry was complete, the sphere was jettisoned via explosive bolts and a three-domed parachute was deployed to slow the lander down further. The descent through the cloud layer lasted around 20 minutes, during which the lander took measurements of the atmosphere and radioed its data to its orbiter. So far all impressive stuff, but the real test would come upon touchdown, which the Venera 9 successfully completed at around 7 meters per second. Many of its instruments began working immediately following touchdown, while the cameras became operational around 2 minutes later. The plan was to have the cameras take 360 degree panoramic photos, but sadly this never happened due to one of the camera lens covers failing to come off, restricting the images to a mere 180 degrees. Still very impressive nonetheless. The instruments revealed Venus's surface to be smooth, with numerous rocks and stones. The lander also measured the light level as 14,000 lux, around the same as Earth in full daylight but without any direct sunshine. The lander used a system of circulating fluid to distribute the intense heat load it was subjected to, and it continued to transmit data to the orbiting module for 53 minutes, at which point radio contact with the orbiter was lost as the orbiter moved out of radio range. While not the first lander to touch down on the surface of Venus successfully, 
that crown still belongs to Venera 7. Being the first to send back photographs was a monumental achievement for both the Soviet space program and the human race as a whole. The Venera program will go down as one of the most historic series of missions and they remained the only spacecraft to ever land on the nightmarish surface of Venus. But hopefully they won't be the last. Our next anniversary is on the 24th of October when, back in 1946, a camera on board the V2 No. 13 rocket took the first ever photograph of Earth from outer space. The V2 No. 13 was a modified V2 rocket that was launched from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The original V2, as I'm sure most of you know, was a rocket built as a German weapon during World War II and would become the first artificial object to travel into space by crossing the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface and is the generally accepted point at which outer space begins. While the V-2 spent most of its life as a ballistic missile designed to inflict death and destruction, it's nice to see that after the war, it was able to fly for a peaceful purpose. The V-2 remained as one of the most historic steps forward in rocket design, and it certainly had a hand in shaping the design of all post-war rockets. Its architect, Werner von Braun, would go on to be the chief architect of the Apollo Saturn V rocket. Also on the 24th of October, we can celebrate NASA's launch of Deep Space One which took flight aboard a Delta II rocket in 1998. The spacecraft was a technology demonstration probe which tested a dozen new technologies, including an electrostatic ion thruster, which had a specific impulse of 1,000 to 3,000 seconds, an order of magnitude more efficient than traditional space propulsion methods. Ion propulsion had been proposed for use since the late 1950s, but due to their lack of performance history, they were considered too experimental to be used for high-cost missions, and there was a worry that unforeseen side effects of ion propulsion might in some way interfere with typical scientific experiments. Deep Space One thwarted all of these concerns, proving the validity of the ion engine excellently. The spacecraft also tested various new scientific technologies, including navigation systems and power systems. The spacecraft proceeded to make the most of its high range and carried out a flyby of asteroid 9969 Braille, which was its primary science target. The mission was extended to include an encounter with Comet 19P Borelli and to conduct further engineering tests. The success of the mission heralded in a new age of iron-propelled spacecraft, including NASA's Dawn spacecraft, which would use the range provided by the ion propulsion system to become the first spacecraft ever to enter a stable orbit of two separate extraterrestrial bodies, Vesta and Ceres. Deep Space One's ion engines were shut down in December of 2001, and by March 2002, all contact attempts with the probe were unsuccessful. It remains in space today, at peace, drifting in an orbit around the sun. And that wraps up this week's rundown of all the best spaceflight anniversaries that we've got to look forward to over the next seven days. So there you have it guys, our comprehensive rundown of all the space flights and anniversaries to watch out for for the next week has come to an end. And as always guys, I want to say a big thank you for tuning into this show. I do very much hope you enjoyed it and on screen you can find a link to the full Space This Week playlist on the left hand panel and on the right should be a video that YouTube thinks you'll like based on your viewing habits. Hopefully it made a good selection. 